I'll, I'll just allow my vice chair to turn on the microphone for me. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen and fellow councillors, and welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee held on Tuesday, the 17th of October, 2023. Just to remind members that this, this meeting is being recorded and will be available for the massed ranks on YouTube. I have today received apologies from Councillor Jay and Councillor Jones and from Councillor Daniels, who is named to substitute in Councillor Lewis Smith, the, the recently elected councillor for Amington. So welcome to this committee and indeed welcome to the council. And I hope you find it interesting and rewarding. Are there any other apologies? Yes, cool. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's not really an apology, so I should apologize. I've got to leave in about 40 minutes. I've got to go see a, a resident about a patch issue. Well, that's a useful discipline for us, isn't it, really? Thank you very much. The minutes of the previous meeting are publicly available. Are they a true and accurate record of those proceedings? Is anybody prepared to say so? Councillor Claymore, thank you. Seconded. Thank you very much, Councillor Dean. All those in favour? Thank you. Moving on then, um, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest, personal or prejudicial, in respect of which they have dispensation? It says here. Are there any declarations of interest? None received, thank you very much. Update from the Chair. I have no updates at this meeting. So I will move on if that is okay. Um, responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. There are none for this meeting. Uh, considerations of matters referred to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council. And there are none for this meeting. Updates on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. We did request a written report from Councillor Jay, given that he'd given his apologies, but apparently there is no update to share at this point. So I will move on to item eight, which is safeguarding children and adults at risk of abuse, a, a report to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. Can I welcome the portfolio holder? Uh, Councillor Martin Summers and Jackie Hodgkinson. Do you want to, to lead off on this, Councillor Summers, or, or are you handing straight over? Um, well, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, I mean, it, it is pretty much as it says. It's a, it's a statement of fact. It's a report that covers um, uh, safeguarding activities, referrals. Um, we've got the legal duty to, uh, to safeguard adults and children within the council, uh, and this is a, uh, a biannual report to, uh, to show progress on that, the referrals in. So uh, I'm, I have an expert, thankfully, who can answer questions. So um, <laughs> you probably won't get much from me if you do ask me a question, but um, please, uh, of course, uh, I'm happy to take any feedback uh, on the report anyway. I'm sure you under, um, underestimate yourself, Councillor Summers. Um, Jackie Hodgkinson, do you want to add anything to what Councillor Summers has said? Um, hopefully, the report is well, um, quite self-explanatory in regards to, obviously, we always put the, the safeguarding figures in there. We always see um, slightly more figures during quarter two because we hit the summer holidays. So that's obviously when we get more awareness raising of what's going on. In regards to our contractors and potentially our housing staff, who the majority of our referrals do come through. Um, safeguarding training, as it clearly states, um, is an annual training that we offer to all our staff members, new and current, as well as our councillors. Um, just to update anybody in case they weren't aware, we've now got the Staffordshire Connects website, which is a live website. So basically that's where we go to now to get all our safeguarding updates all information about um, safeguarding board um, information about early help resources for families who might not hit a safeguarding or a child protection but they're in need of some support uh, potentially from a service that can assess the needs and signpost them to the appropriate 
um, services within the local community areas that they live within. So all that information has now been added on the report. We no longer deliver taxi driver safeguarding training anymore because that has gone over to a commissioned um, service that all local authorities are now using as a result of that. Um, adult safeguarding board, still an active member in regards to the adult safeguarding board and the priorities associated around that and we attend as and when is necessary in regards to any work that we do and also update ourselves on our training. Um, modern, day, uh, modern day slavery, there's an update in there and obviously as a council we have a statutory duty to make sure that we have got a modern day slavery statement which is on our website. Community safety, we've had quite a lot of community safety forums and events over the last sort of um, six months which have been very well attended by all our parties, great partnership working great chance to get back to face to face and networking that's been invaluable in um, promoting the work that we do within the council and it's also um, gave us stronger numbers in regards to our Tamworth vulnerability partnership meetings and also our antisocial behaviour group meetings because we've put that awareness out there now and we're working better with those outside agencies that we didn't always know we're on the cusp of Tamworth and had quite a lot of information about some of the families that we do come across as well and that covers quite a lot of the contextual safeguarding which is around assessing risk outside the home for young people and in the wider community and the wider environment as well. Um, MACE panel which is the child sexual exploitation panel so we're still an active member in regards to MACE. We have as it says um, further down in the report now got in place an antisocial behaviour youth offending officer that's through Staffordshire County Council and we work very closely I'm joining up links with there because that person is a frontline person. They're very active in the communities. They know a lot of the young people that potentially may be put forward into our panel as well. Prevent is still current. So again, we offer prevent training. That's been updated by our community and cohesion officer who's been making sure that the modules are current and relative to what happens in regards to any concerns around prevent. Um, TVP, which I've already talked about, the vulnerability partnership meetings are still um, a weekly meeting every Tuesday at 9.30, that is well attended by all our partners to share any aspects of vulnerability within the community of Tamworth. And then we've also got the Antisocial Behaviour Coordination Group, again, which is a weekly meeting that runs um, on a Wednesday afternoon. And again, any partnership agency can bring along any concerns around antisocial behaviour within the Tamworth area as well. Um, and that's basically it. So if there are any questions, anything that people would like to ask, then please do. So you have also been given a copy of the safeguarding figures over the last sort of few years, you can see obviously the climax in the in the different figures that are coming in for young people and adults. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Um, the recommendation is that we review the report and raise any questions in relating to its content. Councillor Dean. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the modern slavery bit. Who actually polices this? Do, I have some concerns about the amount of um, car wash places we have, and I know there is some evidence that they are sometimes used by the wrong people or manned by the wrong people. I just wondered who actually went around and made sure that these places were um, actually legal. There will be licensing agreements, because obviously they're acting as a company, so they will be licensed and they have to provide the, the appropriate paperwork um, as a standard for that. I mean, that, that's an area that I don't get involved in because I'm not frontline. I don't do the ins and outs in regards to that. Any concerns in regards to modern day slavery, obviously we would report into our modern slavery tactical group within the police, where we do have leads for, and there are um, meetings that do take place within Staffordshire for all the local authorities to attend. So Joe Sands, who's... Um, Obviously, our head of service will attend on behalf of Tamworth and feed in any information in regards to any concerns or any aspects of concerns around modern slavery. And then we will work in partnership with Staffordshire Police in regards to any concerns that we may have that somebody may be a victim. And obviously, that can lead into safeguarding um, fabrications if you've got an adult or potentially families that may be part of that as well. Thank you, but to your knowledge, there is nobody that actually goes around and checks i i places. can't say hand on heart no. that happens i don't i wouldn't i wouldn't know personally okay, that's because that's not an area that i work in thank you that's something we can pick up outside of the meeting councillor dean i think councillor summers 
Thank you. Um, I, I think it uh, would be remiss not to mention that there's a modern slavery hotline you can report the, any allegations of modern slavery to. Um, for the benefit of uh, anybody here or the public, it's 0800 0121 700 or you can report it online at the modern, Report Modern Slavery uh, site. So um, if anybody is aware, it, I think um, the first port of call is to report it, um, even if you are unsure. Thank you. Any other questions? If I may, Mr Chairman, uh, just looking at the figures, uh, and I appreciate why they're broken down into adults and children. Uh, I have a big concern, and people are probably fed up of hearing about the, the pandemic we had a couple of years ago, which we've all conveniently forgotten about if we can. Uh, we had a number of children, for want of a better phrase, who missed out on their last two to three years of socialisation through school. Now, those children are now 18, 19, 20, and are now meeting the wider world because we've allowed them out of the houses. Uh, and I would suggest there's a potential for them to be more vulnerable than the previous cohort of 18, 19, 20-year-olds. Uh, so whilst I appreciate the, the breakdown in the figures, is there any way or is somebody monitoring young adults, so those who are 17 to 24? Uh, I notice if you look at Sussex, they have a separate set of performance indicators around those. Now, I appreciate the County Council does around its looked-after children, but I'm concerned about those who aren't in the care system, for want of a better phrase, who are going through that socialisation now, who missed out because they were locked in their own homes and now in the wider world and potentially vulnerable. So are there any figures that, in terms of the adult bit? Because once you hit 18, there's a long time that you're an adult. Uh, is there anything around that first you know, six uh, seven years of, of adulthood that we can potentially look at to see if there are any increases in vulnerability? Nothing from a Tamworth Borough Council perspective. Potentially from Staffordshire County Council through the Staffordshire Observatory. They may well hold figures in regards to education attainment, in regards to the links that they had in with young people. But I know personally myself, I had a child who was going through GCSEs when lockdown happened. Luckily, he got through it and he's now in university. So from what we, what, from what we know and from what we were, we were aware of during that period, referrals were still coming into us if there were concerns around children. But there was no sort of anything that highlighted a, a risk or a concern or a worry just within the council, but that's not to say that didn't happen. It's because obviously we weren't aware of it because of the, because of the situation that we're in. But your best bet would be to go to the to go to staff job observatory and have a freedom of information in regards to education attainment. We've also in, in other areas we've also seen um, a rise in uh, contacts with mental health services for people in that generation. So I think it's something we can start to look at. Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, of course, just to go into the other end of the scale on the comment Councillor Oates has just made, uh, it was actually demonstrated that babies born in 2020 uh, had their development stunted because for six or seven months, all they thought existed were their two parents. And it did actually stunt a lot of development in some children. And they're coming through the other side of it now, but it, that was the other side of the coin, not for us to solve this evening, of course. Not so much a question, Mr Chairman, more of a comment is, I think it's just worth reminding ourselves what an important area this is for local government. Uh, I'll give you an example. I remember a few years ago, uh, the county council were discussing perhaps scrapping lollipop ladies outside schools. Cuts needed to be made, savings needed to be made. On one hand, you had 1,200 children in care, and the public have no visibility of that. Three lollipop ladies outside a high school, the public have full visibility of. If the lollipop lady bit goes wrong, it's not that big a concern to the County Council. If 1,200 kids in care goes wrong, it's a fundamental problem. But the public don't see that side of it because of, course of the safeguarding and you know, data protection, they can't see that side. And that's the issue we have with safeguarding as councillors. We can't take our eye off this ball as officers and councillors simply because for the 99.9% .9 you get right in safeguarding, the 0.01% that goes wrong, national media is all over it. And I would hate to work in social services because the pressure they must be under constantly. Safeguarding is such a massive issue in our society. And, you know, we bring this through this committee probably once every six months. And I just, you know, while we do that, and it's right that we do that, collectively, as a local authority, we need to ensure this is top of our agenda permanently because it's such an important issue to some very vulnerable people. So, yeah, Mr Chairman, it was more of a comment than a question. It's a helpful comment, actually. So thank you for that. 
are, are there any other questions? So the recommendation is that we review the report and raise any questions, which we have now done. Are we content to um, support the report? Can I have a, a mover? Thank you, Councillor Clements. Remember your name this time. Seconder? Right, thank you, Councillor Claymore. And thank you for uh, your input, Jackie. Thank you. It's really helpful. Item nine. Oh, God, yes, I knew that. I was just wanting to see if anybody tested, picked up tested, on that. Tested. All those in favour? <laughs> thank you very much. Councillor Clements, you got your own back there, didn't you? Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, if Councillor Summers and Jackie, if you want to leave now, if you want to stay, you're more than welcome. But if you want to leave... <laughs> Damage and food, yeah. OK, the next report is Housing Strategy Wellbeing Update and Beat the Cold. Um, welcome to the portfolio holder, Councillor Smith. Welcome. Um, Lisa Hall. That's you, isn't it? Yes, I recognise you. Uh, who will introduce the report of the um, on housing strategy, well-being, and update, and of course, beat the cold ultimately. Absolutely none. I could do with beating the cold at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for having me along today. My name is Anthony Walters. I'm the new um, development manager for uh, the fuel poverty Beat the Cold. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Beat the Cold is a Staffordshire uniquely based fuel poverty charity operating across the whole county. And it's um, been a privilege to have um, serving time with for the last couple of years. So I thought I, thought I would give you some of my impressions of uh, what I've discovered in the last month, couple of months. So if you could move on there at the end, thank you. So what do we do? Um, this is the, the core of what we do is we do, we do deep, deep um, quality work and, and very bespoke work for the people that we uh, serve on how to use your energy, how to be more efficient when we use your energy, how to use your energy for health. Yeah. You need to speak into the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. And then I need to... Thank you. Yeah, done. Okay. So, thank you very much. The, oh, that's much better, isn't it? It's, uh, does it? Does it translate the Glaswegian accent? <laughs> so, we help people understand how the use of the energy, how to use their energy better, um, and particularly for their health. A big topic uh, that takes a lot of time, particularly these days, is um, tariffs, meters, and billing. Now, tariffs used to be a, a big thing in terms of helping you get better tariffs. Tariffs will be back, and they'll be back next year, I think. They've gone away, obviously, with the energy price guarantee. But you know, that is going to, you know, the, the prices are going to, well, they're, they're still double where they were two years ago. And then the energy companies are probably going to start getting a lot more competitive in the year to come. So there's going to be a lot of work helping people get good tariffs and the right sort of tariffs without overpaying. Um, a big issue that we're now dealing with is the subject of metering and particularly smart metering of all types. Um, we are you know, helping people really understand, well, there's a lot of them that don't work. I had a very unfortunate situation with uh, an older person the other day who called up in absolute distress because his smart meter suddenly said that he had a debt of £863. And being a responsible person, he said, I need, should I be paying this? I'm worried that if I don't pay this, they'll cut me off. Uh, it was a software glitch. The actual debt was £86.03. So you can imagine the metering is a major issue in all types and particularly prepayments. So we spend a lot of time um, helping people sort those out, connect them right, um, and obviously liaising with both installers and the energy companies. And then obviously clearly making sure that people's bills are right and fair and correct. Um, we obviously signpost people to the benefits they're entitled to, particularly um, the older people who don't know 
what they're entitled to, a big part of what we do. Um, energy debt is a massive issue now, uh, much more than it's ever, ever, ever been uh, because of the cost of living crisis. And we help people understand that. We help people manage that debt with the energy companies if need be. With, if it's part of a bigger debt issue, we obviously link in to the great people at the CAB or other debt, debt agencies. Um, the key thing we do is help people um, stop worrying about the debt and particularly not do things like switch off or disconnect because they're so worried about the debt. We will help them to get the debt put behind the meter, for example, so it can be managed in a more sensible way so that they can at least keep their heating on and keep safe and warm, which is a key priority. So a lot of that is helping them understand how to manage the meter and then budgeting for heat and for health, and that's a big part of what we do. Um, heating controls, um, we, we all have you know issues of understanding thermostats and TRVs, perhaps particularly the more vulnerable. So we do a lot of work in helping people set their controls, use their controls, and make sure that they're at a safe, warm temperature um, uh, in the right way within the home that they live in. Um, signposting is obviously what we have to do to people that, um, that they need help. And I think this is a thing that came out of COVID, obviously, that we now spend a lot of time signposting and dealing with relatives to help them manage the issues that they have to manage, particularly the, uh, the older and more vulnerable. Um, a recent uh, innovation of what we do is um, helping uh, tenants or owner occupiers who have been lucky enough to have um, eco measures, energy efficiency measures installed via um, through the council solar panels and batteries to help them manage that better and maximize the use of their solar power or their battery power to reduce their bills even further. And in the case of um, owner occupiers who are provided with, um, with panels is making sure that they get something called the smart export guarantee uh, for the power that they don't use that comes from the panels. And that for some people can be a very tidy sum of money and it's very useful. Um, and the other thing we do is obviously, and this is something we've done on behalf of the county at large, is we do funding program triage and checking and document checking and verification of people who are applying for funding via the various eco local authority delivery schemes and home upgrade schemes. Thank you, Leanne. Um, in terms of the people we've helped over the, we've been doing this since April 2021, and as you can see. We've helped you know, over 1,400 people in that time. These are people who come to us in the first paper with an inquiry. And of those, you know, 603, 327, 69, and 70% of them will actually be supported with something or other of support. And it's, it's important that of those, uh, those inquiries uh, and those people helped, over 70% of them have health issues, declared health issues. And that's why in the graph, the graphic below, um, we are very, very interested in their overall health and being and improving their health and well-being is a key part of what we do. And that measurement there is a when a customer spontaneously says in the visit or during the call, thank you, that's really made me feel a lot better, we will record it. It's not provoked, it's not stimulated. So um, we've been improving that over time. So over half of those people are saying, yes, I feel a lot better. Um, as a result of what you've done for me. Thank you, Liam. Um, quickly, before I move on to, you know, where the, the, in, in Tamworth the clients come from and some case studies, I just wanted to demonstrate that what we do is, is, is very good value for money, I think, without talking about the money, but in terms of the social return, um, and particularly for the council on its investment per person of 18, 16 pounds per inquiry, each person is getting an average of 470 pounds and we've distributed you know, your point, you're nearly half a million pounds into the community in the last couple of years. Thanks, Diana. So when we look at time worth, the age groups, um, you can see the split by age group, you know, and it's evenly split, obviously lower in the, um, in the younger age group. And what we've seen is that what used to be the, um, the province of older people is now evenly distributed as the cost of living crisis has bitten with working families, single parents, single moms, single dads. Um, so it's a broader age group of people that we talk to. Um, very interesting in terms of tenure. 
Um, I can't really see that. Let me get out on here. Um, it's difficult to. Um, thank you. Very kind. Um, so I began a broad, a broad, broad um, bridge, a broad spread of of uh, tenures, ranging from housing associations, twenty one percent, your own housing at thirty six, and um, twenty five percent in the owner occupiers, and uh, something that um, concerns very much the housing team is obviously the whole the private tenant route, and basically inquiries from your own tenants have doubled versus last year. Um, and I, I mentioned the help for the working families and, and people on um, on universal credit. Moving on, Leanne, please. And I thought I'd bring with me some um, I think very kind, some case studies um, across that broad range from the wards. So I have a woman in the 70s, a man in the 60s, and a woman in the 30s. This is a very busy chart, but it's the only way to demonstrate and dramatize, I think, the amount of work that goes on. We look at the situation. That particular lady in her 70s and Perry Croft's COPD, cataracts and tinnitus, issues with you know insulation, very, very stressed about estimated bills and what it all meant and how to do it. Um, the energy companies hadn't sent her large print bills, so she couldn't really understand and see what was going on. Um, her heating was totally inadequate um, for what she was doing, but also she had its issue with windows and she couldn't read the bills. So we've... Um, Put on, I, I, apologies for these acronyms, but I won't, you don't need to know what they all are. But I think one of the most important thing is PSR, for those that don't know, is the Priority Services Register. And that's vital um, for that person to be put on there because they will never be cut off and they will get specific support from the energy companies in a drama. Um, we will refer them where required. We will work very closely with the housing team on sourcing them support for energy efficiency measures ranging from insulation to controls to uh, solar panels. And we source them the um, Staffordshire Community Fund grants for heat to fuel vouchers um, and food vouchers where required. And uh, just to show you the, the sort of complexity of the casework is that particular lady was 13 phone calls, one home visits and six interactions with other agencies. And I think the key thing is that we always like to follow up uh, with the customers. We have customers who come back multiple times during the year and over the years as they try and you know, deal with all the issues in the energy world that they face. Um, it's very similar across the board. It's um, particularly people who have health issues and issues with PPMs, uh, prepayment meters. And we make sure that they get an energy performance certificate so they can begin to look at how they might get further support. Um, uh, if your boiler is older than 10 years old, we can get that sorted. And that involves sort of liaising, particularly with the housing team and uh, installers. Um, and again, once again, as we follow up, we have a particularly strong relationship with the Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust social prescribing team as a result of a work that we've done in the north of the county and throughout the county. Um, so we follow up with them on specific patients and make sure the social prescribers in this case are kept in the loop on what's going on and how we've helped that particular patient. And I think the woman in her 30s in Kettlebrook is a particularly good example of the work that the housing uh, team do. And in this case, it's in the private rental sector with a family uh, now of uh, six, or will be of six in January, um, where the, the husband has some mental issues and the, the wife is doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of running the house and dealing with all the issues they have to deal with. Um, private rental had issues of mould, um, not very good insulation, and uh, the boiler, unfortunately, is less than two years, so at less than 10 years old, so it's too young to be replaced. Um, but we keep an eye on the housing team have um, done some tremendous work on correction and enforcement and then when we went back and it's, um, they sort them all out but then it wasn't done correctly and then they sort out ventilation so they're, they're very good at um, interacting with these customers they do a tremendous job but it does involve a lot of telephone calls and interactions and then obviously now we're hoping that um, with the proactive attitude and input of the housing team and a interested landlord, we might be able to secure some insulation under the upcoming government schemes that are coming up because we're always 
um, have our eye out on the possibilities for everybody. Um, and that is it, really, in terms of the complexity. We're working on a specific project with um, the U University Hospitals of Derby and Burton, with um, a community energy company that will put panels on Sir Robert Peel, and uh, the income from those panels that the, the NHS pay um, will fund patient interventions in Tamworth over the period. So that's sort of the innovative way that we're sort of thinking about this hard world of finance and funding. One has to be sort of creative, and I think getting the NH involved is, is a good way of doing it. So always, always being proactive. We'll go as far as we have to, the longest way possible, to make sure that people get the help that they need, uh, particularly in the world we live in today, in the complex world of energy. And I'd just like to leave you with you move on to the next a couple of the, the sort of heartening quotes, and I'm sure you can read those yourselves in terms of um, how people react when they get stuff done. And I think I particularly like the one below where it's so nice that she's actually, this lady's actually able to heat her whole home for the same price. And she's got hot water for the same price that she was, that she was using for one room previously. So hopefully that's a snappy summary of, of what we do. I'm very happy to have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Any any questions? I mean, I've got uh, a couple, if I can, about houses in multiple occupation and how you deal with those, and unhelpful private landlords and how you deal with those. Um, we have to do. There's a certain amount of visiting and cajoling and, and stating the case. Um, we liaise with the housing teams, obviously, and um, it has to be said that Tamworth. Well, I've said it before. They the, the very, very good and proactive at, um, at dealing with that. I don't know if you guys want to say anything about that, but it's it's quite impressive. I don't want to dish anybody else, but I would say one of the best and most proactive housing teams in that regard in the county. Do you want to add anything to that or just blush with the praise? Which would you like? <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. That's very kind of you. Um, there is some detail in the report that I'll go through. Um, as a result of that, once we've gone through that, there may be some questions that you have for us jointly. Sure. Um, if you're OK to stay, Anthony, is that all right? Delighted. Yes. Thank you. So I'm just going to go through the, the housing strategy report. This is the quarter one report where possible. Sorry, can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. <laughs> Is that what it... I'm not feeling the benefit, though, I have to say. <laughs> oh, no. So just to go through the housing strategy wellbeing update, this has got the, it's got the figures for quarter one, and where possible, I've put some figures in for quarter two as well. For those figures that aren't complete for quarter two, I will bring them into the next quarter. So there is perhaps a little bit more than them. Um, than we would have anticipated, but some of those figures are available. So the first part is priority one, and that's around the First Homes Initiative. I'm pleased to say as a team, we have just received our first application for Elan Homes at Dostil Two Gates for affordable housing there, which we're currently processing at the moment. That is around initiatives to enable people to get onto the housing ladder. Priority two is making use of our existing housing and related assets around that. And that is an initiative that we're bringing forward and we're basing it on primarily two wards of Belgrave and Glasgow currently. In relation to fuel poverty, well, what can I say, Anthony? I think you've probably covered it all, haven't you, there? So Beat the Cold have been commissioned as HEAT, which is our Home Energy Advice Tamworth. Um, we brand ourselves calling HEAT, but Anthony heads up for the area on Beat the Cold there. And he's gone through some of the things that they can offer, which include wall insulation, cavity wall insulation, loft insulation, heat pumps and solar panels in order to benefit households and their running costs that they have and their utilities. They can also help out with emergency payments such as fuel vouchers and food bank where necessary. And as Anthony has taught you about the PSR, where families can be added or elderly people can be added as a priority group. Um, we then lead on to some of the statistics around that um, there's two funding streams that one is hug to which has got a certain criteria and there's some figures there around the funding around that and the expectations of households that will benefit from that and the other one is one that 
Auntie has referred to earlier, and that refers to um, the EcoFlex project and how that can be targeted for certain criteria into certain households there. And you've given some examples there, haven't you, Anthony, tonight of, of works that you've done. Just to move on to the houses of multi-occupation, which Anthony also does work with. Um, currently, we've got 66 active licences, 23 that do not require a licence, but do re are required to comply with legislation. We've now got a proactive scheme in place of inspections of HMOs and we have put in there some figures for you. We did recruit a, I think we're running on 1.9 members of staff in the um, HMO team at the moment. So you'll notice that since the second person has started, we've obviously been able to increase our capacity for looking at doing those inspections. Damp and mould, always current interesting area. Um, as you can see, we've picked up our proactive inspections there. We peaked with 23 in May. Those are something that where we've got both staff in place. We will increase to keep those as high levels as possible. Um, we've then got some figures around disrepair, which do seem to be... The figure for quarter two of 29 does actually only reflect, because of the time of reporting, July and August. That is actually quite high at 29, considering the previous month's quarters have been lower. So there's a bit of an increase showing at the moment due to those. Um, if we then move on to the inspections, so HMO inspections, four, two, three per month, and that will continue to follow. Um, number of Category 1 hazards has been one. have actually served a prohibition notice and actually since going to writing we've served another, which is where we put an order upon a property that in simple terms requires the landlord to rectify the property while the tenant cannot stay in situ. So there might be electrical or damp and mould issues where the family actually need to vacate the property for that period. So we've got one in that period and another one since. Tamworth Borough Council's housing, those figures are reported separately around damp and mould. April to June, got 26 jobs for invoicing. And in the second quarter, we're actually about the same job, about 30 because of one rejected. So those do seem to be fairly stable at the moment. Um, there's some information there around Eco4 that we can go into and you might want to discuss further. There's the criteria for that is set out below. Um, NHS referrals can also come in through Ecoflex, and they don't necessarily need to fit that criteria. It just needs to come via an NHS referral, um, of which case they are perhaps faster tracked, aren't they, through the system because we're not having to do those standard testing on that. Um, if we just go on to highlights of the report, um, we go down to the headlines. There's an introduction to the homeless and rough sleeping strategy, which we obviously have in the new homeless hub that is due to start this autumn. So that is in a month. Our disabled facilities, disabled facilities grants. The DFG is aimed at people who live in private properties whether they be homeowners or they be in a private rent. And that's about adapting the property so that they can remain in it. So currently at this stage, as, as of today, 172 cases open. DFA is slightly different. That's owned at Tamworth Borough Council tenants only. And if cases open at the moment, we've got 127. We've still got usage of our 11 sheltered schemes and there's some information around those. Um, they're aimed, aimed at age 55 and over. They're subject to a needs and risk assessment upon the incoming tenant to ensure that suitability. I think we need to stress this is about independent living for older people. It isn't a care provision. And there's some information on our dementia-friendly status that has remained. Thank you. Is there anything you want to add, Councillor Smith? Yeah, thank you both for um, going through that and explaining that in, uh, in detail. Appreciate that. The only thing I was going to add was, because um, on the last agenda item, I think the issue of anti-slavery came up. And I just thought I'd mention, and tell me if I'm wrong, Lisa, um, 
I'm sure I've had conversations in the past um, in regards to HMO licenses on the yeah, bottom of page 21, I think it is. Um, I'm pretty sure as part of that, is there some form of sort of checks or I don't know whether it's a formalized check. It's something to bear in mind if there are inspections of properties as part of the HMO. I don't know if you wanted to expand on that. So yeah, the team do, work, do go out and inspect the HMOs and we look at occupiers of those properties while we're there. Obviously, the team are safeguarding trained. They've also had training around other key factors. So they are there to identify any, any actual issues at the property that may get referred into other streams, such as modern slavery, um, while they're at that property. We do have a project which is called Super Safer Nights. Super Safer Nights does sometimes entail immigration coming with us. They also target properties within the town where they might be more likely to be having that kind of information going on that's got feedback to them or where they suspect it might be more likely. Right, any questions, councillors? Councillor Clements. Thank you, Chair. Just one about disability facility grants. Every year we have obviously more grants than we can afford to pay out, but there are boroughs across Staffordshire that don't spend whatever their allocation is. When are we going to start asking for what we require and asking those boroughs, well, you didn't spend it last year, so why are you asking so much? You know, we can't have boroughs not spending their DFG grant money and then us sitting here waiting because we can't afford to do one. Um, I think it's a, a little bit criminal in a way, um, probably a little bit harsh, but you know, there's boroughs across the county and I'm not going to sit here and name them. It's, it's public information that they don't spend all their money and then we can't get enough to do the grants that we need. I think that's an absolutely valid point to raise, Councillor Clements. Um, DFA and GFG are obviously run under Paul Weston. Would you mind if I take that back to him to give you feedback? Lovely. Thank you. Any other? Councillor Oates. Thank you, Mr Chairman. So, do you want to come back? I wanted to pick up on Councillor Clements' point. Uh, that is a national government problem. Uh, so what I would suggest is not only talking to Paul Weston and getting the exact figures, uh, I would suggest that if we so wished, we make a recommendation that the cabinet or cabinet member lobbies government to get that evened out because the money received for, uh, for these works is not ring-fenced. It lands in a local authority and they can use it to support their budget, which does happen in... I'm not going to name the districts either. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... So I, I, think, I think we should ask the Cabinet to lobby and continue to lobby to get that smoothed out uh, and allocated on demand, not allocated on population numbers or, or, or whatever the calculation is. So is that an additional recommendation, Councillor Oates, in addition to the one that's there? I'm, I'm happy to move that if, if anyone seconds it and supports it. I think it's only right that, that it should be done on on um, need. need but need based rather than yeah. we've got a population of X so we need this money this amount of money. If you're not spending it, you clearly don't need that amount of money. And we've got people waiting for those disability adaptations to be done that are waiting longer because we haven't got the money to do it. And just on that and Councillor Oates knows probably what I'm about to say, we do these adaptations on properties. Now I'm aware of one in Wilnicott that was done for a husband. The husband has passed away. The lady is still living in the property. Surely that adaptation could be given to somebody else. And yes, that lady would have to move property, for example. But if it's, ad if it's adapted ready for somebody that needs it, surely that's where what, what we should be doing and that might sound a little bit harsh but when we're talking people that have got disability needs and high needs then we need to look at it a little bit differently 
Would you be happy for me to speak, Tina, with regard to that? So there is provision within the Housing Act to move a family on where the household is adapted and the adaptations are no longer required. There is also incentive around that for the household to take up if they're going to a smaller. So if you want a later conversation about that, we can pick that particular property back up. Thank you. <coughs> Does that sound like the sort of wording you had in mind? Yeah. Councillor Rhodes. Uh, uh, in terms of the last part of that wording, uh, rather than the current calculation, because okay. that just covers yeah. other bits as well, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Sorry, I didn't actually hear any of that. Can you just repeat the motion? Because I'm obviously genuinely interested and I, I totally agree with what's been said. It is a, sorry, I'm going to have to shift this because I can't see that. <laughs> uh, recommendation to Cabinet to continue to lobby government to have funding for DFG to be allocated on the need of the district rather than the current calculation. That seems eminently fair to me. Have you any response to that immediately? No, no, that seems pretty clear. Uh, I just want to make sure, yeah, it's definitely covered, but that seems good. Thank you. Can I have a mover, please? <coughs> so we just need a vote on this, do we? Okay, all those in favour? Thank you. So any other questions on the Councillor Dean? Thank you. Um, Going back to the bit, I'm trying to find which bit it was under, the beat the cold, with the um, different schemes for energy efficiency, I would just be interested to hear some figures around that, especially around the air source heat pumps, because this has been in the news a lot, and I'm not quite sure how much it's being used. So I would be interested to know how much Tamworth is taking it up, that and solar panels as well, in my... Um, climate change hat on and another bit that just popped out to me is the inspections on the HMOs with regard to modern day slavery and anything else that might be going on there what form does the inspections take who do you see is the whole house visited just how are these inspections carried out? Okay, so if we address HMOs first, an appointment is made with the owner or the manager of the premises. So it is literally who is in the property at that time. They do tend to be fairly short notice. We don't put weeks in ahead. The ladies do tend to book them out, so most people are seen within that week to go out to the property. We are taking that household as it presents at that time. If we've got any concerns, we obviously do go back. Once we've done an inspection, we can then go into a basis of how uh, we will set that up to be more regular to monitor it. So any concerns we will raise at that point and we'll continue to monitor them. So it isn't a case of particularly one inspection. It might be multiple to ensure that something is rectified or if we've got a concern, how that concern's been addressed in that period. With regards to the amount of um, applications come to us to be approved, we don't actually get to see the end output of that. Um, Anthony certainly does referrals that come through beat of the cold. We refer through the system. We give our guidance as to whether it fits the criteria or not. Just check with my colleague, Mel, do we actually get... Do we, no, get we, to, don't, we don't get to know the we end product? Process, yeah. So yes, yeah. yeah, so we don't actually get notified what the end improvements might be. So it, the property is then assessed. The assessment is then looked forward to see if it's that possible to do. It goes over to a contractor. Um, so certainly Beat the Coal will be aware of what's gone through them, but I don't know, Anthony, are you ever made aware of outcomes? Um. We have the data under the Staffordshire Warmer Homes hist historical data 
in terms of what has been installed under the Staffordshire Warmer Home Scheme, lads. Uh, I certainly know three because I've been here the last couple of months with um, that comes from the county council. So there's, there's a breakdown by borough and district on the measures installed. I can't access it here because of Wi-Fi, but they, we could certainly pass that. I mean, you guys might have it still, but it was done by Alison Dean Jones at Staffs County Council that you could bring to the next meeting or I could bring or, or something of that ilk, which summarizes the money spent and the measures installed. Is that, is that fair, Lisa, I think? Thank you. If I may, Chair, it's just, it would be really interesting to, to know if we are using these, um, more eco-friendly um, methods when we're putting stuff in, or if it's, we're just doing like for like, because it, you know, it's, it's down here in the list. So are we actually using those methods? So what I will do is I will arrange in the next report to get some output figures for you, probably for first quarter of the quite online ongoing projects, and then we can have a look what actually got got installed in that period. Just just on the back of uh, Carol's question regarding HMOs, you say you take it as they present at the time. Well, living where I live, adjacent to Thomas Street, I'm aware of properties that have got more than five or six people living in them. And we know when there's more than five or six living in them because the amount of cars that are trying to park and then end up at the top of Rosewood Close. So you can't pull out and it's dangerous. So we know when they come back. And that it seems to be peaks and troughs around different times of the year. Um, at the moment, on touch wood, it's all it's all QT, but I can guarantee as we get closer to Christmas and we get closer to the new year, there'll be more, more of them arrive and there's more cars arrive. So surely that then creates another problem for us because we don't actually know how many people are living in a household that could actually be deemed as unsafe. Right, so what we do, Tina, we have got access to various schemes, so we look into various software that we've got in-house to check via who we expect to be living at the property. That should tally up with the amount of people at the property, assuming that they're all there, which they're probably not at the time of the visit. If you have got any concerns about more than the appropriate amount, there is an internal address of private sector housing that you can refer in on, and that will, that will actually instigate a visit to the property. Thank you. Anything else, colleagues? Councillor Maycock. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a nice to see a bit more detail on the HUG2 uh, scheme that's going on, because uh, there wasn't uh, a lot in there on the last report. But just looking at the, um, the grant allocation, so Tamworth's got £550,000 to an expected 31 properties. But further down, a couple more, a couple of par paragraphs down, it's saying that there could be up to 96 properties. Uh, that's on page 20. Any response from the officer?
Is this something we need to pick up outside of this meeting? You haven't put, you put your mic on. Sorry. So the figures for Tamworth for Hub 2 are around 550,000 with an expected 31 properties um, that have been for spend around that. That spend is based around obviously the size of each area and the expected properties that will fit that criteria. Hug2 is just one scheme that can be accessed. There is other schemes that can be accessed as well. So wh where we may have provision within one scheme, it may be actually eligibility for a different scheme as well that we might be considering. But, but, but if these are all off, off gas grid, these are all going to be oil homes, aren't they? Right, the actual off-grid homes are mostly electric, interestingly. Um, they're not necessarily old properties. A lot of them are properties that were just installed with electric. So while we're not necessarily promoting the obvious, which perhaps would be seen to be a boiler, we'll be looking at the efficiencies around them homes to bring them up to a standard where their EPC will be higher than it currently is. So off-grid as in no gas, no mains gas, we wouldn't necessarily be looking to install gas as part of that. We may be looking at things such as solar panels and heat pumps. If we just jump to Appendix 3B. And we scroll down to page 61. Is that Amington figure an anomaly? I think we've established that Councillor Maycock has read the report. <laughs> <laughs> Is the figure for Amington an anomaly? And if it's not, why such a uh, drastic figure for it? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, it is an extremely high figure compared to the other areas. What I would need to do is get some more information around that and feed that back to you from our homeless team as to why that is so high. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Claymore, can you turn your mic off, please? Thank you. Councillor Claymore. Yeah, while I appreciate that you said you will get some um, information to us, um, with such a high figure, I would have thought that you would have had a, an inkling as to why that figure is so high, because that would be a question that we'd want to scrutinise, I'm sure. Absolutely, I'll bring some information back regarding that from the very team themselves, so it's quite thorough as to why that figure is what it is. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Dean. Not, not a question, but a thank you to Anthony, sorry, I don't know your other name, for, for your report. And what I would like to do is see if there is some way that we as politicians can help to um, promote <coughs> the service that you give, because I didn't know about it and I probably should have. And my worry is that there may be a lot of people out there who need your help and don't know about it. So if there is any way that we can help as politicians to promote awareness. Um, 
Brilliant. Again, uh, Tower of Borough Council, I, I don't want to be constantly praising you, but the high, some of the highest levels of council-based referrals come from the Tamworth Borough Council versus other councils. Methods to refer are obviously directly to the Beat the Call website, and you put then it's particularly important you put in your email, and then we'll make sure that, that we come back to you. Um, Lisa is always challenging us on, particularly because I'm new, on doing events. And uh, we have, obviously, it's best to do those events where the need is, is, is most. So um, we're very into doing events, but where we can have real impact. Because um, uh, I often say to people, I'd rather do 10 people on the phone than two people in an event. I know that sounds harsh, but again, it's, it's, it's a bit more. Um, and we're very, I'm particularly interested in sort of um, going to certain areas that have the highest levels of, of uh, emergency admissions and older people with disabilities and uh, long-term illness because we can really help with that. So I'm absolutely open to suggestions, referrals. Um, we have leaflets that we can give you if you wanted to have them, you know, to give out to people. So we have resource, both digital and, and analog, if you want those. So I think if if you just channel your request by the household team, we'll, we'll, we'll get something done. But I'm really interested in uh, doing more events and meeting people. Um. Chair, if that can be sent out digitally to us, now's the time to do it, obviously. So get it sent to us and we'll get it put on. Our, we're all, like most of us are on social media, so we can get that done. And perhaps Tamworth Borough Council can do it as well, get it out onto there. Facebook page, Instagram, or whatever else they use, and, and we can all share it and follow it up. Yeah, I can arrange that, Tina. Thank you. Yeah, it'll be useful for surgeries as well, resident surgeries. It'll be really helpful to be able to refer. Can I just add uh, there, Chair, that, that Anthony's actually doing a range of events across the borough over the winter, aren't you? So Anthony's arranging to go out. His first event is at Dostal Boys Club next month at targeting our older and more vulnerable communities that might actually benefit from his scheme. So there is some promotion work going on, which I'm sure will bring in a lot of referrals. Again, Chair, we need those sent to us so that we can publicise them in our wards. Um, obviously, I'm not Dostal, but I can still share the Dostal Boys Club one for those that might want to go. As soon as we've got that list of the five, we'll share that with you. Um, we're definitely starting off 24th of November at 2pm at Dostal Boys Club. Um, there'll be four of us to follow, so we'll share those. Thank you. Well, I'm going out to visit residents this weekend, and I'd quite like to know if there's something I could tell them then, to be honest. And I'd just like to know if you have relationships with GPs, um, in your local of any sort. Oh, sorry, is that a bad word? Oh. But, um, uh, there's an eco flex referral route via the NHS that's working quite well if you have a relationship with a GP who's prepared, particularly for one of their patients who has cardiovascular, COPD, four or five types of disease. That, and they're, we're getting them, but. Or if you've got a sympathetic social prescriber who can then get the GP to do it, perhaps. Okay. Yes, accessing GPs is a bit of a sore point, really. Uh, is there anything else from anyone? Oh, yeah. Uh, Councillor Maycock. Yeah, it's just um, with the appendix, appendices, um, in the main report, it says that Belgrave and Glasgow have been, been highlighted as um, hot spots to do the housing and health, but but through the appendixes, that it's not Belgrave and Glasgow aren't really standing out as why they should be hot spots. It, it, is that just because citizens' advice aren't getting the calls to them, and the the the, the data isn't really showing through? Is it? Grove and Glasgow have been long-standing areas that we've tried to target within our communities for many years and the data suggests there is higher employment levels, there is, there is more deprivation on those estates. 
obviously one of the things around certain established estates like that is getting into them to actually provide that health and assistance. So part of Anthony's package around Beat the Cold will be looking to get into those communities to get them to work with us and something that we've got various properties of all sorts of tenures on those estates, the team being out there to promote that. Yeah, yeah I've got, I've got no, no uh, dispute about the, them two, two wards uh, being deprivation hotspots. It was just that the, the, the appendices aren't really echoing that. That, 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 that's the point. Councillor Smith. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Oh God, I'm sorry. I was going to say there's some uh, information. Goodness knows what the page number is. Um, 45 of the entire pack, page 45. There's a little bit on there about um, Belgrave and Glasgow um, being identified as having high levels of need. So I would possibly check that out. But um, take your points that you know at the end of the day. Those two uh, that have been listed, need, there needs to be a link to the data as to why they've been chosen. Anything else, colleagues? We're being asked to do um, a couple of things. Um, the first one is to consider and endorse the report that we've heard tonight, in addition to the recommendation that's already been passed. And the second one is to consider how regularly we want to receive these updates. Very regularly. How often do we get them at the moment? Quarterly, quarterly. quarterly we get them at the moment. Especially as we're coming into the winter period. Yeah. So quarterly, it seems, is favorite to stay on. So the recommendation is that we consider and endorse the report. Um, do I have a mover? Thank you. And a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Dean. All those in favour? Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to, um, to you two and to you, um, Anthony, for your input today. I think it's been really important. I didn't know about Beat the Cold until today. Um, we should really know about it. We should really know about it. Um, and it would be useful, I think, by the time I go out this weekend to know something about how I refer people to you. I think that would be extremely helpful. And can I also thank uh, Councillor Smith and Lisa for their input here today. And uh, if you wish to stay, please feel free. If you have some more pressing engagement, thank you very much for your attendance and input. Thanks for that. Yeah, I've got to crack on. I've got to meet Elise Holder. <laughs> so off I go. Thank you. Thank you. Right, the next item is the forward plan. Um, are there anything on the forward plan that the committee wish to be considered within this scrutiny committee? Nothing. Thank you very much. Moving on, working group updates. There is no working group update at the moment. And um, looking then forward to the health and wellbeing scrutiny work plan, the items on the agenda for the 28th of November meeting are the leisure strategy update and the wellbeing strategy baseline and priorities and the homelessness statutory on call and out of hours arrangements. Does that all seem reasonable? Thank you very much. Is there any other business? No. There being no other business, can I thank you all for your attendance and your input? Thank you very much. <laughs>